Welcome to Hope Under Fire. Today I'd like to start a series through the book of Colossians, kind of a running commentary. And the the title of this series is going to be, So uh, That You Might Walk Worthy. And the, the idea here is that as Christians we are called to walk a certain way. Um, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the times. The Bible talks quite a bit, and Paul especially talks quite a bit about the Christian's walk and what it should look like. As we go through this um, book of Colossians, my intention is not to do a super, super in-depth word by word study that's going to take me four years to get through it um I, i'm looking more toward you know somewhere around 16 18 um half hour lessons to get through it chunk by chunk but it is going to be exegetical but a little bit more zoomed out and i'm going to be using a certain focus as we go through it so i want to be up front with that i'm not um coming at this completely blank i'm coming at this passage with a focus because i think there is a theme to the book of colossians that i want to kind of draw out for the christian and apply it today and it's wrapped up in this phrase that we'll keep coming back to which is basically this we do not obey what we do not trust we do not trust what we do not know and we do not know what we do not study and we'll keep coming back to that phrase because it is it is kind of crucial to understanding what's going on in scripture. The Bible, one of the reasons the Bible was written, and we'll look at this and we'll unpack all this as we go through Colossians and as we come to these different parts. But the Bible is written, uh, one reason is to equip Christians to walk worthy and to be ready for all good work in the work of the ministry, to equip them for ministry. As we look at this book, that's the obedience part. But the problem is, how do we obey what we don't trust? To illustrate that, if I'm walking say downtown and uh, a gentleman walks up to me or to you and he looks very clearly homeless and perhaps he's a large imposing fellow and maybe talking to himself looks a little bit crazy sounds a little bit crazy and he says hey why don't you step into this dark alley where no one is i got a surprise for you are you going to obey him well, not if you have a choice, more than likely. You're, you're probably not going to. Why? Because you don't trust him. Now, here's the difference. If my wife asks me to step into the bedroom because she has a present for me, <laughs> I'm much more likely, well, no, bad example. My wife would probably murder me too, but <laughs> you get the point. Uh, you know, I, I trust my wife. I would probably obey her if she asked me to do something much more than I would some imposing, uh, crazy, homeless person. And, and that's the concept. Can I obey God if I don't trust God? But how do I learn to trust God? How, and, and I just kind of gave it away. I have to learn to trust God, but how does that happen? We don't trust what we don't know, and we don't know what we don't study. So we go back to the marriage kind of analogy uh, of husband and wife. If I'm going to say I love my wife, but I don't know anything about her, do I really love my wife if I know nothing about her? Probably not. Same is true if I say I'm going to love God, but I know nothing about God or very little about God, can I really truly say that he is the object of my affection? The answer is probably not really. I mean, he might be important to me, and I'm not saying that if you don't know a lot of theology or something, you don't love God, but I am saying is, have you made him a priority? Have you made God and knowing God, relating to God, understanding God, have you made that a value and a priority in your life, or is it just kind of a backseat thing that, I don't need to know that. And that's what we're going to look at Colossians and see, is this vital for the Christian? Is the Christian supposed to study to know, know to trust, trust to obey? Is that the progression? So uh, I'd like to get into the first section here, which is going to be verses uh, 1 through 8. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we have heard of your faith in Jesus in Christ Jesus, and of your love, which you have to all the saints, 
for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you, since the day you have heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Now in this section I want to highlight a few um, words and, and the phrases around them and kind of look at some of the other stuff in Scripture and then see if there's some corresponding application for us today. One of the first things I see here <clears throat> is that we have the, the repetition of Paul often talks about faith, love, and hope, right? So you have faith, heard of your faith in Christ, your love which you have to all the saints, and the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. And those are three things I want to key in on for a minute. So let's start with the first one. Verse 4 says, we have heard, uh, actually let's back up to three, we give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul often does this where he talks about praying for these believers, praying for churches, and continually praying for them. And I think this is a pattern that he sets that is something we ought to be following as Christians, to constantly pray for one another. Um, but as we're going to see as we move forward, there's things that he specifically prayed for that I think that we need to start praying for. But one thing he was doing is praying and giving thanks. Now, if you followed Brian's stuff, he did a whole attitude of gratitude or something like that sermon that was a really great dive into the idea of thankfulness and how crucial it is. Um, if you look at Romans chapter 1, and we'll go there for a minute, Romans chapter 1, which is the kind of the fall of all the nations, um, verse chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So God's wrath is poured out on these nations. We we see that in this uh, passage. Um, he gives them up, he gives them up, he gives them over to reprobate mind. Humanity is kind of all judged as sinners by this, but notice what kind of leads into this. Verse 21 says, because they knew God, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and neither were they thankful. That idea of thankfulness is tied in with the fact that they did not give God glory. They had no gratitude toward God, no thankfulness toward God, and that led them to not glorify God, which led to the fall of mankind. Uh, you know, and, and beyond Adam, each one of us became ungrateful, and in that ingratitude, we no longer put God in the position of glory and honor and praise that he deserved. And God allowed that. It, we go through the passage, and God permits man to go this way of ingratitude and ungratefulness and to no longer give him honor and glory. And this is what leads to our fall and our demise and our, uh, you know, just uh, derangement, I guess, as a, a species. As we become more and more deranged, it's because we give God less and less glory because we're less and less thankful. So, Paul starts with this idea of gratitude, and he says that we have heard of your faith in Christ. Now, <clears throat> faith can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it can mean, first of all, the body of doctrine and beliefs, um, as in the Christian faith. So it's all of the teachings, all of the theology, everything that constitutes Christianity is called the faith, the Christian faith. It can also mean a personal faith, um, which would be toward like salvation, like I place my faith in Christ for salvation, which would be a more personal faith. But I believe what Paul's talking about here is their faith in the sense of faithfulness, how that they are faithfully obeying and acting and walking as Christians. And so that's what I think he's referring to here when he says, we heard of your faith in Christ. Now he says this of some other uh, individuals as well. If we go to 1 Thessalonians, and I'm going the wrong direction, 1 Thessalonians <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, Paul opens his letter to the Thessalonians as Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from the God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayer, remembering without ceasing 
the work of faith. So again, there's the work of faith. It's not just their faith in Christ, but it's that they're faithfully working, they're faithfully obeying, and the labor of love and the patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing brethren. Um, we'll go jump into uh, 2 Thessalonians. Again, he opens uh, verse 3. We are bound to give thank, again, there's that thank to God, always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth. So again, there's this working faith, this, this outpouring of faith that is doing things. Um, then in, let's go Romans 1 verse 8. Now, Paul had not been to Rome at this point. He says, first, verse 8, Romans 1, 8, first I thank my God. Again, he's thanking God. He expresses that gratitude through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, who I serve in the spirit and the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I may mention of you always in my prayers. So when I hear things like that, where Paul is talking to these churches, or uh, I think in Philemon, or no, Philippians, he also says something similar. Oh, I'm going the wrong way again. Philippians chapter 1. Um, I thank my God upon every, this is verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Again, there's that thank. Always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy uh, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day to now, and then drop down uh, to verse 8, I believe, or 9, excuse me. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more till the knowledge, in, uh, yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So they, all these churches, now these are the churches that um, did well. Uh, you know, I would say that these are the churches that when Paul opens with that and talks about their faith being heard throughout all the world, Paul spends very little time with these particular churches um, dealing with lots of sin issues. In contrawise, if you look at like 1 Corinthians, for example, um, Paul spends quite a lot of time uh, dealing with sin issues, gross immorality, drunkenness and debauchery in the Lord's Supper, um, fornication, um, cliques, factions, uh, preferring the wealthy over the poor. There, there was a lot of mess. Um, he still uh, he tells them that they're called to be saints. Um, tells them grace be unto you. But what I don't see, what I don't see in the first beginning of, of Corinthians is I don't see that their faith is heard of throughout the whole world. I don't see that they're behaving themselves in a way that honors Christ. He tells them that they're called to be saints, that they're supposed to be saints, and then he spends a good portion of the rest of that letter instructing them in how their attitudes and actions are not consistent with what Christ would have them to do. So on that faith side of things, in back in Colossians, this is one of the things that God wants for us. God wants us to have that exercising faith, that walk, that, that faith that produces and can be uh, known about throughout the whole world, like in the Romans passage. Now, here's the application to today, a little bit, or, or one little rabbit trail that we could talk about it on. And it's the concept that is constantly out there today, and that's of um, revival. We want revival. We want revival in America. We want revival in the churches. We want revival, revival, revival. So I have an unpopular opinion on revival. And before you shoot me or anything like this, let me explain. I personally don't like the concept of revival. And, and before you throw stones, hear why. What is revival? If I need to revive something, what does that mean has happened to that thing? Well, that thing has deceased. It is impotent. It is no longer uh, alive or useful or doing anything good. If I say I want revival then in the church, you know, the thing that Christ died for, the thing that said uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against, if I say the church needs a revival, that means the church is dead and impotent and weak and 
maybe the church is struggling in some areas. And I'm not saying that I, I'm putting my head in the sand and pretending like the body of Christ is just doing awesome. Always has, you know, no problems, no flaws, um, you know, no blemishes or wrinkles. I'm not saying that, but I don't like that concept of revival because it tells me that our attitude about the church is that the church is impotent and useless and whatever else. Now, if you're of that persuasion, though, here's the other side. If you're of the persuasion that the church needs a revival, then I'd ask you, dear Christian, what are you doing? Because revival isn't, isn't a thing that just gets bestowed on you. Revival is simply obeying. It's, it's simply all of us Christians in the body of Christ deciding, I'm going to obey the word of God. I'm going to do the things I find in this book. I'm going to love and cherish and prefer one another. I'm going to edify and exhort and build up. I'm going to obey the will of the Lord. I'm just going to do ministry the way God intended to do ministry. I'm going to go out there and minister to the saints. I'm just going to do it. That's revival. But it just takes us deciding, I'm going to put this before me. I'm going to put the body before my own needs. I'm going to put ministry as one of my priorities in life. And that's hard. It's much easier for us to just go, God, please send revival to our church. God, please send revival to our nation. God, please send revival to our communities. God, please do that. You do that, God. And I'm just going to sit here and wait for it to happen. No, brothers and sisters, be faithful for the word of God. Again, we're going to come back to that. We don't obey what we don't trust. We don't trust what we don't know. We don't know what we don't study. So we're going to start studying this and we're going to start knowing it. And then we're going to start trusting as we grow in faith and we grow in our knowledge and we grow in experience in life. We're going to go out there and we're going to obey. That's how revival happens. But it starts with, we got to study this. So the faith, they had faith. They were out there doing it. They were out there obeying it, right? So he says in verse 4, we heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have for the saints. This is a great place to start. If you want to see revival happen, this is a great place to start. Start with loving the saints, the body. So go uh, grab Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Paul says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, did God send Christ to die for the sins of the whole world? Yes. Did he send Jesus to die for the world? Yes. Did God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son? Yes. But notice here, though, there's a, a, a special sense where Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, yes, God gave himself, or Christ gave himself for the world, but in a special sense, he loved the church and gave himself for it. That's how husbands ought to love their wives, he's saying, this sacrificial love that Christ had for the church. Now, uh, the reason I bring this passage up is we need to understand what is God's attitude toward the church. What is his attitude toward the brothers and sisters in Christ? It is a sacrificial love that God would humiliate himself, become his own creation, be tortured and put to death by his own creation um, because he loved the church and gave himself for it so that we might be saved through him. That's the sort of love that we're supposed to have for our spouses, but that's also the sport, you know, that should influence us on how we treat the church, the body of Christ, how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. What kind of love are we supposed to have for the brethren? Grab uh, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Nine through ten. Oops, I'm got a little bit. It says, and let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men. Now, we're supposed to addict ourselves to ministry, right? Don't be weary in well doing. Don't get sick of doing good things, because you know what? Sometimes you do good, and it just turns out bad. 
Don't get weary in that. Do good. Continue to do good. Don't weary in doing good. Just continue doing good. And as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men. But notice what it says in verse 10. Especially, especially, you're supposed to do good to everybody. Don't get weary in doing good to everyone. But especially those who are of the household of faith. Is there a a special, even higher amount of love that we're supposed to give to the body than we're supposed to give to the world. Are we supposed to respect, love, try to evangelize the whole world? Sure. But there's an even higher uh, standard that God holds us to when it comes to relating as brothers and sisters in Christ. Grab 1 Peter. <laughs> And I'm not going to get through everything I wanted to in this one, so we'll have to make a part two of this. First Peter, if I can get there, chapter one. <clears throat> chapter one and verse 22. Seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, regardless of uh, who Peter might be writing to, Jews or Gentiles, I think this is still the, the mind of God toward us as believers. Are we supposed to have an unfeigned love of the brethren? See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, right? This is how believers in Christ need to act toward each other. One more, grab 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Again, 1 Corinthians is that rough, really rough church that needed a lot of help. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter um, 16, verse 15 says, I beseech you, brethren. He says, I beg you, I implore you. You know the household of Stephanas, the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, to the serving of the saints. They have addicted themselves. I beseech you. And he says, what is he beseeching them about these people? Submit yourselves to such and to everyone that helps with us and laborers. They have addicted themselves to serving the saints and to ministering to them and to serving the body of Christ. And, and Paul says, I beg you, those kind of people, submit to them. Submit to them and in everyone that helps with us and labors. That's hard to do. I get that. But that's the attitude that God has. And so in Colossians, and as we're going to see in the, the next part, uh, faith, love, and then we get to hope. But we're going to ask, how do we get there? How do we obey that? How do we get to a point where we have that sort of working faith and that love of the brethren um, and, the, and that hope? How do we get to that point? So um, this is a good point. I'm going to kind of end it here in a second, and we'll pick up with hope in the next pass or in the next video. But I want you to think of that. We don't obey and that's what we're supposed to do right the one of the reasons the bible is written so that we would obey okay that we would have changed lives that's one of the reasons of scripture and we'll talk about some of the other reasons in the next video but one of the reasons is that we do obey the the bible is supposed to change our lives it's supposed to impact us but how are we going to obey if we don't trust god if we don't trust his word how are we going to know god in his word how are we going to trust it if we don't know it how do we know it if we don't study it and so as we continue to go through this we're going to continue to unpack that um, but until next time, I love y'all and I'm praying for you. See you later.